Welcome to Ryan and Rodrigo. On tonight's show, we'll learn about Brazilian late night TV. But first, a few English doubts. So, Ryan, um, I don't know. Um, during a live this week, we talked about the verb to be, right? Not only the verb to be, but verbs that mean one thing, they have one meaning in a language and maybe two meanings in another language, in a second language, right? Um, do you have any, can you sum up uh, something, uh, sum up what we discussed about these verbs? Well, yeah, one example is, is the verb to be, which in English is, is so simple that, that it's dumbfounding, really. And uh, when I started- I'm sorry, can we, uh, what, is, what is the word you said? <laughs> dumbfounding. Dumbfounding, okay. Uh, this is, can you, can you spell that for me, please? Because that's a, uh, that's a very nice word. Is it dumb, like in stupid, like D-U-M-B? Yeah, dumb, okay. D-U-M-B, founding, F-E-F-O, U N D I N G dumb dumb founding like something that finds dumbness. Yeah, it is just it's just so surprising. It blows my mind. Okay, how that is. simple the verb to be is in English. But of course, I had never thought about this until I tried to learn another language. It just seemed normal to me, and I assumed that every language was like English. Of course, English. What do you mean? You never. You never thought about this. You never, you don't, you don't learn about all the grammar we learn here in, in your school, in your elementary school. <laughs> no. <laughs> no? I, I think that, that Portuguese, or not Portuguese, Brazilian schools teach grammar much better than American schools in that they teach it uh, because at least in my school, we didn't we didn't learn grammar really. We uh, we learned how to read and how to write and how to speak. And a lot of classes were practical classes about ah uh, today you're gonna write an essay or today you're going to make a speech for the class or today read a book and then tell the class what you read in the book. But grammar, like the rules and the structure of grammar, was never taught. So when I started to learn Portuguese, and one of the very first things that you have to learn in Portuguese is uh, the verb ser and the verb estar. And this was so confusing to me because in English, it's just, it's just the one verb, it's just to be. And and it took me a long time to figure out what was the difference between ser and a star. Because I couldn't figure out why there even needed to be a difference. Why? Why should there be a difference between, like, if in English, I, I am cold and I am tall? Well, um, something that really confuses a lot of our students is the uh, like talking about age. Um, uh, it's difficult for them to remember that you don't say that you have a certain age, that you are a certain age, because the concept is different in both languages. But let's not get too philosophical, uh, or we'll get to that later. Uh, the thing is, maybe just, yeah, please. Oh. So, so yeah, I had to learn that in Portuguese, things that, things that are temporary, like today is a cold day, and so I, I feel cold today. I say with a star, I say that... Uh, o dia cold. está quente. Yeah, está quente or cold. Está tá frio. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I think... If, I, yes. if I'm talking about something that's permanent, like how tall I am. I need to use ser. I need to say that 
Eu, eu sou. Eu sou alto. Exactly, and that's what people don't get. People, uh, when I when I try to explain that to people, and I don't really know why I explain that to people, because it doesn't really matter. Like in the end, like as Linkin Park would say, in the end, it doesn't even matter. But uh, it really doesn't. You just use the verb to be, and it's just a verb to be used. You don't have to learn uh, what's behind the verb, the idea, and uh, no, you you don't need to. Uh, and the The biggest proof of that is that you guys don't learn that in school, right? And and everybody speaks English there, okay? Uh, so uh, much better than we do, by the way. Uh, okay, ah, but much better than we speak English, not Portuguese. And also, well, but anyways, but do you think that happens because English is a English allows to be a bit less controlled, freer? or a, a bit more informal than Portuguese? I don't know. I, now that I understand the difference between ser and estar and the different types of to be, I actually like it because it lets you be more specific with what you want to say and what you mean. And so I appreciate being able to, to use two different two different types of to be. And in English, it's, it's sloppy. It's not very specific. And I don't like it, actually. I appreciate the, the Portuguese having these two different types of verbs. Um, yeah, and it's simpler, it's easier, but it's not better. I mean, I mean in, in Portuguese, you know, you know the situation, you know the state before the, like in a second, Uh, after the second um, uh, word of the phrase, of the sentence. And in English, you have to wait till the end. Yeah. When you say, I am, you don't know if, you're, if, if it's permanent or temporary. Only when you say cold, then maybe... And even, and even then... Exactly. Like, you can be a cold person. Cold person. Like, yeah, then antisocial, you have to... Not a, not a nice person is a cold person. Yes. So it's so English it's depends great. more on context. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, yeah. Also, there's a okay. The verb to be. Uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, that's something to talk about for hours. But uh, <laughs> the easiest thing to say is that to be uh, in English it means temporary and. Uh, permanent, right? Depending on the context, depending on what's before and after, uh, depending on the situation, depending on everything. But in Portuguese, it just it means what it means. You don't need to uh, go around, or you don't need to understand the context so much. You don't uh, have to think so hard about the situation uh, in Portuguese because the language does it for you, I guess. Um, And something that I've found teaching students is that in English, the more, the more advanced the English gets, this is obvious, the harder it gets, but the more impossible it gets to understand. Like English. In English, because the rules stop applying and, and everything becomes an exception at advanced English. And so you really just have to go by your feeling, by the context, and you, you can't trust the rules that you learn in basic English. But in Portuguese, it seems like if you can understand the rules, and I admit the rules can be complicated and a bit difficult, but if you can understand the rules, then things get easier as time goes by because you just follow the rules and you eventually get to the right situation. Um, so I don't know, they're, they're different languages that way. And it's my feeling on that. Okay, well, um, this to be thing is, uh, how can I say, it's, a, it's not really a, something that Something that uh, is 
it's not really a big question to our students. It's not really a big problem to students in general. The, this this specific thing, they don't even talk. They don't think about that so much. Uh, it's more difficult for American people to le when they're learning Portuguese, right? Uh, yes. It's just much the same way as, for example, uh, verbs in English. They are, you know, conjugate. You do, but you don't. You don't have a lot of forms. There's you know? no five. Yeah, and also, for example, in the present simple is just the same, and with one tweak, like do 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 does yeah. do do do, and in Portuguese, every single person pronoun changes. So a lot of when I was younger, I watched uh, movies or uh, soap operas with American people speaking Portuguese. And they didn't conjugate the verbs in Portuguese. Eu ficar. <laughs> because, because in English, they don't. Yeah. English is much more practical, assertive, maybe, in that matter. Uh, so so it, this is something that's also difficult for American people to memorize every specific conjugation of verbs for every specific t tense uh it's it's insane it's too much okay it demands years of practice because yeah. no one is going to sit down and memorize like how many are there for fazer are there like 50 jesus christ yes yes yeah. there's not a specific number uh but, but but that's like trying to memorize all of the phrasal verbs yeah, exactly exactly and there and are hundreds of those and there's phrasal, no there's no way to just translate them because phrasal verbs don't translate. So you just have to memorize every single phrasal verb. And you can translate. You can understand. You can understand the. Well, you have to translate them. Like it, when it when it, when. Uh, in the end, you have to translate uh, to understand it in. You have to translate. I mean. If you want to understand it in Portuguese in another language, you 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 can you have to find you you find the translation after all. But then uh, it's not really a translation; it's just an equivalent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you you can people want to translate the the two words, but it it's actually an idea. You don't translate. That's what people should understand. You you never you should never translate words. You should first understand the idea and then find an equivalent idea in your language. But you don't like, for example, in a heartbeat. What does what, what does that expression mean? In a heartbeat, it means yes. fast, very quickly, right? Very fast. Fast in a heartbeat. In Portuguese, uh, if if we were to translate for Portuguese to English, it would be in the blink of an eye. Which is also, like, an, which expression, is also right? an expression in English. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you piscar de olhos in a blink of an eye. Actually, it would be in a blink of eyes. Okay. piscar de olhos. But you, you, in Portuguese, we don't say uma batida de coração in a heartbeat. We might understand, mm -hmm. but it would sound weird. Uh, so we have to understand ideas, concepts, not really work like it's like names you don't when when we we're very young we learned that in school you never you should never translate names and we should learn that about all words you should never translate a word you should understand the idea the concept of a word you see a table and you understand what a table is okay. so yeah names like trying to translate los angeles exactly you can't translate from but then are you put three languages in a mix, so it's difficult. Um, okay, and it's not, it's not what we suggest. Okay? It's like memorizing uh, lists. You have phrasal verbs list. You have irregular verbs list. You, you don't just memorize them. You don't sit down and read them to memorize. I had a friend that came to me and he said that uh, he read the whole dictionary. I said, okay. So, and then I opened the dictionary. So, can I test you? Yeah. 
I opened a dictionary and I found a difficult word and I asked him and he didn't know. And then I found another one and I asked him and he didn't know. I said, why did you read the dictionary? No, because said, no, 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 no. You don't, you don't just read the dictionary, the whole dictionary as if it were the Bible, you know? Um, so uh, language has to be contextualized and practical, right? And phrasal verbs are like kings or gods in a world of context and, and practice, right? Phrasal verbs are the most practical thing. Get up, get down, get in, get out, get away, get over, get on, get around. So they're very practical. They're very practical. In this case, get is there just to, just to, how can I say, uh, are those cats? No. Okay. Uh, because I, I'm afraid of cats. You have a dog now. Did you get a dog because you're afraid of cats? Exactly. Uh -huh. So I got a very, very big, angry dog. I'll send you a picture later. Somehow I doubt that it's big or angry. She said. Uh -huh. uh, but anyways, so um, yeah, phrasal verbs are very practical. Phrasal verbs are like verbs with lasers. Right? How? Try to explain this to me because I don't know where you're going with it. Verbs are just verbs, you know? Verbs are just specific actions. Okay. Phrasal verbs take verbs and they just, like prepositions were just there, you know? <coughs> they were <coughs> around and about and uh, out and about. And then, um, as, as Rusty would say, out in a boat, oot, right? Out, out the boat. Out, yes, exactly. Rusty are uh, people from Canada. Um, so they were there and they decided uh, we should join verbs. We should just get together. They're much more powerful. So, so they're like in just, a relationship, right? Or is it they're like in a relationship. A yeah. verb and a, and a preposition got, got married. And you know, you you always know that couple that mix perfectly, and then they they seem to be one. You know, you never see one, and you, every time you see that person, you think about the other. You know, you see Ryan and you think about Ali, yeah. and you and the other way around. You see Ali and you think about Ryan. So you, phrasal verbs are just perfect couples. You know, they're they were meant to be, um, and. and Phrasal verbs are verbs improved, you know? They are um, prepositions are there to, how can I say, to make verbs more specific, to make English closer to what Portuguese is. Uh, okay, with the verb to be, for example, as you said. Yeah. So you have a verb, that is like turn and then you say turn around mm -hmm. and or turn have... up or turn down so exactly turn can do many things so what kind of turn are you doing well it's a turn around turn around now try to picture or try to imagine the total eclipse of the heart without around okay <laughs> Turn, something's missing, you know? Turn around. So that's what phrasal verbs do. They, they make everything better. Okay, it, like everything, okay? And they make up for a big part of uh, the English language and communication, everyday communication, right? People use phrasal verbs all the time. Also, for example, I just use they make up, okay? They make up for. That's a phrasal verb, right? Yeah. Okay. But make up, it's used all the time in Portuguese for makeup. 
yeah. for stuff women put on their face, stuff people put on their faces to look better or differently. Um, but also makeup uh, uh, means to invent something, right? Yeah. And one one thing that I realized is that phrasal verbs many times are used to substitute uh, Latin words. So you people prefer to say makeup instead of invent. Yeah. There there are a lot of phrasal verbs that um, please. Well, it's it's a little different because when you make uh, like children make things up. But like Steve Jobs invented the iPhone. But children, can, you can say it, that you can say that children invent stories. Uh, well, you don't, yeah, but you can. You can. And people understand exactly. Good. So that that's why that's why I say that phrasal verbs are verbs improved. You know, because yeah. you, you can use the the word invent, but makeup is, is better. Yeah, it's more specific, but and I, it became better. I'm not sure that you're right about they replace Latin words. No, no, not, not they all fill, the time. They fill a more specific function, like they fill the the less um, uh, because a lot of times in English, the Latin words are there for the, the bureaucratic or the legal or the, the more important situations. Yeah, and more the non-Latin words are there for, for common situations. Understand? Yes, I do. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, it's not that phrasal verbs always replace uh, Latin words, but some phrasal verbs, um, I, the, the feeling I have, first, the feeling I have is that phrasal verbs came after Latin words. If you compare phrasal verbs in regular Latin words, phrasal verbs are more modern or newer. So much so that you have uh, in British English, People use way less phrasal verbs than American English. American people use a lot of phrasal verbs. Um, and so uh, what I mean is that uh, some phrasal verbs came to replace um, um, Latin words in a better way, you know, to, to specify Latin words a little to give more specific details or specific meaning to definition to Latin words. It's not that they were created, that it's not that a, a group of people created and said, let's replace Latin words and let's create, let's create something to do that. So it just came to be, you know. Um, okay, so phrasal verbs. What are, I, 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 exemplified a lot of uh, phrasal verbs with the, with the verb get, right? Mm -hmm. uh, turn, we talked about turn. Uh, and the, the more general the verb, the more phrasal verbs you can, you can create. create. Uh, so, and also phrasal verbs are how can I say? Phrasal verbs have a life of their own. You can, even when you don't know a phrasal verb for a specific situation, but you know English and you're in Dutch with English, even if there's no phrasal verb for that specific situation, what I think, what I judge to be difficult, but even when there's no phrasal verb, you can create a phrasal verb. You can create phrasal verbs with any verb and a preposition. And it, it, and people would understand. Most people would understand. If you know enough about English, you can just create a phrasal verb with a name, with a, with anything. Can you, um, I don't know. Uh, you use a name of someone that's dumb 
to say that somebody is doing something dumb. And so you say uh, the name of the person and, the and up, for example, or out. Like Fabio, let's Fabio up this situation. And Okay, exactly. So Fabio is someone happy, very happy and joyful and very nice. So we made the situation better. Okay, we made the situation uh, just let's more. Bring some, let's bring some cheeseburgers and some Coca-Cola and some video games and just sit around and laugh and drink our, our Coca-Cola and play video games all night. Let's Fabio up this, let's Fabio up this party. Exactly. And people that know Fabio would understand. But if you don't know Fabio, uh, if I'm in a group, of people that don't know Fabio, I would use let's Charlie Sheen up this party. <laughs> that has a we different use, meaning. <laughs> yes, exactly. So that's the beauty. Depending on the verb, in this case, Fabio or Charlie Sheen, it takes a completely different meaning, but specific. So phrasal verbs are amazing. And that um, is what I was saying earlier about English rules, not making sense when you get to higher levels. It's that anything can be a verb. You can make Charlie Sheen a verb. Exactly. Yeah, it's uh, whatever, sure. But Charlie, Charlie Sheen, Sheen is a verb now. I'm pretty sure Charlie Sheen was already a verb because uh, it's Charlie Sheen. <laughs> uh, but if you try to do that in Portuguese, the grammar police will come to your house and arrest you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so English. Um, English is more open for, for, for that. Even, yeah. for example, uh, well, we'll talk about that in, a, in another opportunity, right? Sure. About, uh, about how, um, maybe we can talk about next, uh, next episode, about how, for example, uh, you guys allow yourself to even write in a grammatically wrong way. Like, for example, I see a lot of people writing should of instead of should have. I see a lot of people writing, I should have did. I should, not so much did, but I should have went. Writing, if you, because when you talk, it's, that's normal. But I see people writing that way. And when I, the first thing I think as a teacher is like, oh, Jesus. But then if I, if I were to correct that person, they would say, so? No, it's, I'm just talking to you. I'm just writing to you. It doesn't matter, you know. Oh, just forget about it. Why? Why should I? I know the correct thing. So, <laughs> but in Portuguese, uh, if you do that, if you if you make a mistake, like for example, people mistake mas, which is a conjunction, an adversative conjunction, mas, m-a-s, with mais, that means plus or more. People write that wrong all the time. And, and just other people just correct them, straight up correct them. Like, no, you don't. And so uh, English is more, at least American English is more open for that, right? Yeah. Well, a lot of times people are wrong on purpose. And I guess we can talk about this next time. So. Yeah, yes, yes. So, um, and because that, that's very cool. It's really, really cool because, uh, and actually, uh, we could exercise our first, first graduation as social scientists in, and even, in your case, political science, right? Uh, and talk about how in Portuguese, for example, uh, as you as you move through a different social class you make more or less mistakes. And I, uh, I don't really know if that happens in English uh, with poor or rich people. Uh, maybe, maybe, and because here in Brazil, there are region difference, differences, uh, but there's also in the same part, the same region, the same city, people that speak and write in a way because they had poor education, horrible education, and other people in the same part of town that speak in a much 
sophisticated way or everything correct. They know the grammar. They know like the sophisticated structures. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, the level of intelligence or, or or wisdom is different, you know, or is is one is better than the other. But but the language uh, changes according to the social class in Brazil. It changes a lot. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's the same. The same thing. And, and the only thing that a lot of people who are maybe a higher class do is they know how to be wrong on purpose and other people of the same class recognize each other being wrong on purpose. Okay. And it's like a it's like a dialect okay. of the language. So that only people who know how to be wrong on purpose to each other give each other status. Okay, and they do that for like for example, the very, very famous marketing campaigns of both uh, McDonald's and Apple, um, I'm loving it, and think different. These are both grammatically incorrect. Yes, yes, I always tell my students that. They're wrong, but they're but wrong they're on genius. purpose. Yes. And, and so the people who thought up these strategies are very rich now and very, very successful marketing people. And they're that way because they were wrong on purpose. Yes. And and uh, yeah. yeah, I always tell my students that I'm loving it. That that's or think different. Um, think different is even better because it has so many different meanings in one in like in one sentence. In the, in not yeah, sentence. Yeah, there's no there's no subject, but it is a sentence, right? There's a verb. So I'm loving it. It's beautiful. You don't you don't say you're loving something. But then if you just, if, if the sentence were just, I love it, it's just a normal sentence, a regular sentence. Everybody says that, I love it. But I'm loving it, it makes you pay attention. It, uh, what, yeah. what is that, right? Um, in Portuguese, that's not allowed. Uh, th oh. That's called, in, well, in English, to poetic license, but in Portuguese, for advertisements, uh, you know, it's not that it's not, it's not allowed, but it would be maybe incorrect, you know, politically incorrect, or maybe just not cool. Uh, so they, in, in Portuguese, it's amo muito tudo isso. And it sounds good. Amo muito tudo isso. But it, it's not as strong. And Apple is still in English. Think different. For everyone on YouTube, this is Aria, and for everyone else, remember to subscribe, like, and share our videos, and don't forget that both Rodrigo and I are English teachers, and if you would like private classes with us, contact us today. Something, something, very, something very new here in Brazil, Ryan. Is um, well, two things. Last week we talked about stand up comedians, right? Stand up yeah. comedy, it's relatively new. Okay, there were comedians that did stand up in Brazil, but they were comedians, sketch comedians, the character comedians, and they had a show, for example, she could. Easy, which is our biggest comedian of all times. He had he um, he recorded a show in Madison Square Garden in the seventies. Really, I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, in Portuguese. Yeah. Uh, yes, and he was packed full. Uh, so 
uh, but it was a show, you know, and it was much more like uh, Danger, to no, uh, Rodney Dangerfield, uh, one-liners, yeah. you know. Like he put everything together, he tied everything, but it was mostly one-liners. And um, but so in the, after 2000, stand-up as a thing really started in Brazil with Rafinha Bastos being the most prominent one, you know. Uh, uh, also, because of that, I think naturally something else happened. Since the 80s, we, we here in Brazil, we only had one show that was very late at night on, our, on TV, that was Jo Soares, which is the second probably, uh, probably the second biggest comedian of all times. Okay, maybe they're the first to, well, anyway, so uh, he was on for, for 35 years. Yeah. Okay. Would you compare him to like Carson in the United States? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I could. I could. Yeah, because okay. Carson was, I think, maybe the first big one, right? Really yeah. big one. And, uh, and for a long time, Carson was kind of the only one, right? Yeah, uh, I think so. There were others, but then... They weren't very popular. It was yeah, and, and the format was different. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Brazil, was just Jo Soares. A lot how, of long, people, how long was he on? What years from when to when? 89, maybe, uh -huh. or 86 to 2016, 15. Oh, recently. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, before that, he had uh, just comedy shows. And so he was on for a long time and only Joe Suarez. So after 2000, a lot of stand-up guys started, and the two most famous were Rafinha Bass and Daniel Gentili. And then Gentili is smart, like business uh, business wise, he's smart, and he. So he came up with the idea. He was on a on a kind of a political show, you know, CQC, uh, and. He interviewed politicians, both left and right, and he was famous. He became famous. He took a beating of politicians and police officers and everything. And then he, I guess, he came up with the idea of having a late night show in the same format as the American uh, late night shows are. Uh, so late night shows yeah. are today, or more like more like David Letterman, more like this format. More like this format, okay? More okay. like this format. More, more like the old format. The old revisited format. More like Le David Letterman in 2010, okay? okay. Because it, David Letterman in 1980 was completely different, okay? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> he started and he became very famous. And then after two, three years, he went to another a bigger uh, network. And then Rafinha Bastos filled in for him. Uh, and then a lot of uh, networks felt like hmm, people like it. And Rafinha Bastos, Fabio Porchat, Ta Taverneck, Danilo Gentili, a lot of comedians had their show. And Danilo Gentili still stands. And now Ta Taverneck. Okay. You think that there were too many? Shows, you think that they for, too for much? our reality, for our reality, yes. But it was like five, you know. Yeah. But he went from one, and in two months, five, you know, uh -huh. doing the same thing, exactly the same thing. Okay, uh, and um, so Tata Vernacchi, then the Gentili, they still stand, and there's Pedro Bial, Pedro Bial, which is a reporter. He's not a comedian. He's just, he's a reporter, okay, very famous one. He's very intelligent. He's a very good reporter. Uh, he got, he has a lot of awards. And um, 
he started one after Joe Suarez stopped to fill in for Joe. But it's less comedy and more information. Okay. It is kind of, there's a band, there's him. The, it's usually, usually hosts are here and guests are here. And it's the other way around. He's here and guests are here. Oh, okay. Big change. Yes. Revolutionary. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, there must be a reason that hosts are here and guests are here. And when you watch it, your your mind notices and you all the time you're thinking, that's wrong. What what are you doing? So but that's a de a, a detail. So uh, yeah. And I think it's to identify it. It's, it's not exactly a late night show, you know. Um, that's, the setting is very important. Uh, so, <clears throat> for example, Stephen Colbert, the band is here, but the host is here and the guest is here. Okay? Yeah. Jimmy Kimmel, Seth Meyers, all of them. Conan now is different, but yeah, still Conan here and here. Yeah. yeah, but the, the position is the same. It's just the, the table went out. Um, the desk and anyway so uh, now the reality is that Illusion Chile all the rest just got cancelled Pedro Bial will be there forever because uh, it's another thing you know mm -hmm. it's a late night show but a, a different one and the Illusion Chile now our reality is the Illusion Chile okay uh, and the problem is that uh, because of the because of all the fighting uh, 2008 uh, about elections, the eventually got um, branded as a right wing comedian, late night host. Okay, which he is, uh, <coughs> and at the moment, um, he is critical of the government. So now everybody hates him ah. and everybody likes him at the same time. Everybody watches him, but nobody wants to say they like him. So it's weird, you know, it's very weird, but he's so very nobody, famous. So nobody will share him online. N n yeah, no, share him. It's difficult. Yeah. No. no, no, not anymore. They, they used to, the right used to. Yeah. The left, never. But the right used to, uh, but not anymore. Not anymore. Okay. Uh, so I think that's a, a good view of our late night history. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Now tell um, me, did you, did you used to watch late night shows? I never really watched late night. I... I never paid attention to the, the Letterman Leno battles. Um, and then Conan came on and I didn't care because I didn't, have, I didn't have TV when I was, ah, we had TV, but I didn't watch when I was in high school. And then I went to college, I didn't have a TV to watch. And then I didn't have TV again from 2004 until I came to Brazil in 2012. I did not no. have TV for that whole time. No, let me ask you a question. Do you think, um, uh, what about your friends, your young friends, when you were a teenager, for example? Uh, was late night a uh, young people thing or not really? It's usually something parents watch. It was more for older people, not for teenagers. Um, my my friend who 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 was more cultured, who was more intellectual and smart, really liked David Letterman and thought David Letterman was like a god of comedians. But all of my other friends didn't care at all about this, and and thought that like Adam Sandler was hilarious. Yes, yeah, he is. That's, that's true. Right? Yeah. Or Will Ferrell, you know, Adam Sandler. And then we graduated to thinking Will Ferrell was hilarious, you know. But the late night guys were not on our radar at all. 
and people like my grandpa love Jay Leno. Oh my God, Oops. my grandpa loves Papa Jay Jerry. Leno. Yeah, Papa every Jerry. time that he goes to, well, not anymore because Leno is off. But every time that he went to California, he would see Leno every oh. single time. I can I can understand. Leno likes cars, machines, and and agents. So yeah. I can understand that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Leno is more conservative. He was always more conservative. He was always a good comedian, but always more conservative, clean, uh, more conservative. Well, yeah, okay. But um, and now tell me something. So the t Carson was behind you now, right? He's because way uh, then, behind because you. I think okay. Carson stopped in ninety one, ninety two. Yes. Right? Yeah. 90, so 90, I would have four. been six way too young to care at all and because there was no internet there was no ability to watch carson clips okay until you know today. Um, <laughs> jimmy kimmel uh he had a 12 year old birthday party themed uh david letterman late night with david letterman 12 year old <laughs> when uh, jimmy kimmel would have been 12 in what 90 how old would have Jimmy Kimmel been? I, I, let me check. That would have been like 1990? Maybe? Maybe 92, 93? I don't know. Jimmy Kimmel's not that old. No. He just had a baby. Just had a baby. Yeah, didn't you see? Last year, last year, I guess he had a baby. Maybe the baby's a year and a half old now. Uh, I can't. I can't find the the picture. Ah, here. I found the picture. I'm trying to see. How, oh, no, no, 18, not 12. Ah. Yeah. So, it would have been... The, the picture is... It would have been 85. 1985. Yeah, about, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was that, trying to find... But today, I really like watching old clips of Letterman and and conan i love old clips of conan he's yes. he's the best yes yes he is um, he really is the best well he was a writer for the simpsons and saturday night live in the 90s so simpsons in the 80s saturday night live in the 90s so yeah he wrote the the, the train episode for, for the simpsons so monorail monorail yes monorail monorail yes Conan is amazing. Uh, so um, and now, and recently, I've been watching a lot of clips of Conan with his his travel clips with Jordan Schlansky. Yes, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> I like I like his uh, his bits with Sona too, with all the crew, but uh, Sona and Jordan. Jordan's my favorite because they make fun of. No, he makes fun of Jordan all the time, right? Yeah. Uh, and sometimes uh, they just they just crack up and they they can't yeah. they can't they can't hold it in. But Jordan is good at at it. He he never breaks character. Well, mm. he does when he goes a little too far. When he takes yes. character too far, then he can't handle it anymore and he breaks up. Yeah. Like he was talking about that this wine it has yes. the smell. Of, that of, was, of of moss and earth, yes. <laughs> and, and even that he was a can't... major break uh, of character. <laughs> yeah, like that was huge, and he couldn't <laughs> stop laughing. He couldn't. He stop. just, yeah, <laughs> that was yeah. amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah. And at the time he gets the, the cappuccino machine or an, ex an espresso machine for his own office. 
and then I like the, the I like when Conan does uh, reviews on everybody, and he just goes around destroying all the office, <laughs> throws chairs. Yeah, Conan is nice. Yeah. Uh, by the way, we have a friend. I think we, you mentioned our friend before, Fabio. If Fabio were to be a late night host, well, he would be Conan. Yeah, uh, oh, for sure. Yeah. He has the same spirit as Conan, just wacky, yes. wild randomness all of the time. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, <laughs> okay. But and also, the, what about the, the hosts today? What do you think about them? Because now that I, yeah, now that they're all on the internet and I have TV and I have time, I watch, I watch all of them sometimes. Kimmel and Fallon and Colbert. What do you think about them? I don't watch any of them. Uh, Kimo, uh, Col even their clips on the internet, you don't watch? No, not really. Kimo, Col no, I don't watch it. I don't watch them regularly. I watch some clips, you know. Uh, but Kimo, uh, now I watch. I watch the clips more for the for the person they're interviewing. Uh, okay. okay? Uh, Kimo Colbert, Fallon, the other guy Noah Trevor. Uh, Noah Trevor is different. Uh, because it's the, what was the name of the show? The Daily Show. The Daily Show, yeah. Um, but Kimo Colbert, Seth Meyers, um, and Fallon. I don't, I don't watch any of them regularly. I watch some clips if, if I want to see the, the, uh, who they're interviewing. And, but with Letterman, for example, uh, no, I watch Conan, of course. I still watch Conan. But with Letterman and Conan, I watch for Conan. You could just be Conan show and I would watch it. And it is Conan show. And with Letterman, I watch because of Letterman, you know. I watched any interview, any, all interviews I watched. Um, and he would just make something out of the interview, you know? Uh, and even Leno, Leno was a good interviewer, but it was much more uh, just protocol interview, you know? And people went there and he, they, they sh sh no, they, they talked about stuff, uh, but Leno was good at keeping up with the conversation, you know? Um, so now I I only watch Conan. Yeah. Conan is who I watch. Sometimes when I'm when I have time, I try to watch Colbert. I like Colbert very much. I don't like I don't like the show so much, but I like Colbert very much and I will always like him. Um, I sympathize with Seth Myers. He's he's a good He's good, you know. Uh, Fallon, Fallon, I like to watch the like the game clips, you know. Fallon is good for that. Fallon would be a good host for a variety show, you know, like The Price Is Right or <laughs> oh, Family Feud, something <laughs> like that. No better than Steve Irving, not Steve Irving. What was the name? Steve Harvey. Harvey, yeah. No, Steve Harvey is much better. At doing that but Fallon would be good for that you know yeah uh, he has a good uh, energy a good like yeah. ah, get everybody to play along let's do this silly thing together ha, 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 ha. Uh, but I cannot stand his interviews because no, no. he laughs at anything somebody says it doesn't matter if the the guy, the guy that he's interviewing doesn't <laughs> want him to laugh he still is is laughing like Fallon mm -hmm. interview some some guy and he'll say uh, and yesterday I walked out my door and Fallon <laughs> starts laughing like, oh, God, shut up, Jimmy Fallon. And let he's, he's good talk. for, he's a good impersonator. Very, very good. Yeah. Uh, he's good with music things, you know, he's, he's very good with doing like rap history. He's very good. He has great friends that helps. Okay. Uh, and uh, so the sketches are nice, you know, with the show, the interview, eh, not so much. 
Uh, Kimo is nice. I like Kimo. I like his show. I like Kimo show better than Colbert, for example. I prefer to watch it, but Colbert is a better host. Colbert is a better host. Uh, and Conan, Conan is Conan. You know, Conan can just be there, and I'll watch it because it's just, uh, it's just funny. Uh, and Conan, oh, I don't remember other ones. Do you do you follow any? Do you follow anybody? Um, I try to watch Colbert most of the time. Um, but not every day. I really like some of his segments. Like his normal like uh, monologue is is not so great. But uh, some segments he does, not segments, like sketches, I guess, are funny. Um, I like I like Kimmel's perspective sometimes um, when he talks about some things it seems more natural than than the other guys but before we go today what are some some things that you've been cooking recently because I know you like to cook, I like to cook too. And now that we're stuck at home all of the time, cooking is is one of my hobbies, I guess. Something to to do to pass the time. And so like yesterday I made a meatloaf. And it's more like an American meatloaf than a Brazilian meatloaf. Uh, we there's no real meatloaf in Brazil. You know, meatloaf is an American thing, you know. <laughs> uh, here in Brazil, it's just uh, when when you're lazy and you don't know what to do, you you, you do a meatloaf, you know. Uh, yeah. You make a, a meatloaf. But it's a different style. I mean, it's not even the same. It doesn't look the same. Like Brazilian meatloafs that I've had are like meat rolls. Yes. You, you take a bunch of stuff with the meat and you roll it, and then there's different layers because you roll like I don't know. Yeah. Different types of meat and vegetables all together. But uh, an American meatloaf, I, I took some hamburger meat and chopped up some onions, chopped up some garlic, and poured in some milk and crumbled like 10 slices of white bread into the kilo of meat. Crumbled the bread and then just mixed it all together and shaped it into the form of a bread, of a, a okay. loaf of bread, and then baked it all together. It's it's not. There's no there's no filling. Well, there yeah, it was filled with breadcrumbs and onions. And, but you you don't make a hole in field. I mean, it's just a it's it's a dough, you know. Yeah. It's a it's a bread, you know. Yeah. But a, it's a loaf. It's a loaf exactly. It's a meat loaf. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like All right. I understand. No, but I, I never I never make meatloaf. Uh, what I've been cooking, I've been cooking very regular food, and I've been out of ideas because I have to cook all day, not all day, but every day. Uh, so I cook. Some days I cook some very simple things like uh, um, hot dogs with tomato sauce and rice. Nice. Just that. Some yeah, and it, Victoria loves it, but I. I make that once a month because hot dogs in Brazil were just like made of, I don't know, wood, you know? <laughs> who knows? Who knows what they're made of in Brazil? Or in America, who knows what hot dogs are made of? So I make uh, rice, beans, hardly because hardly ever do I make beans because I don't eat beans so much. We don't usually eat beans around here. Rice and meats and vegetables. Uh, I don't like rice so much, so I like uh, potatoes, mashed potatoes, or or just steamed potatoes or baked potatoes with vegetables and meat. Uh, mostly 
beef, you know, red meat. Um, and I make some pasta sometimes. You haven't cooked anything, anything different just to experiment, just to try out? I made chili today, but it's not different because I usually make chili, you know, that's when, that's when we beans. You made chili? We, yeah, I made chili, yeah. Nice. That's a little, so, it's a little special. Not everybody makes chili. I, well, I make chili all the time. Yeah, it's so do, easy. I know. But not everybody makes it. I no, 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 no. Nobody makes it. No, yeah. it's not nobody. Yeah. People don't usually. <laughs> but no, I understand. People don't usually make chili. No, I I do make chili a lot because it's so easy. It's just yes. it's the way I make it is easy. simple. Yes, just like beans and meat. Yeah, hamburger meat. So. And maybe if you want some onions or pepper or yeah, but no, no that's. I don't even say but that because it's not even necessary though. No. Uh, so that's what I've been cooking, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. just uh, regular stuff. A lot of stuff with sauce. I've been buying a lot of tomato sauce, tomato paste, you know, uh, and everything with sauce. I love tomato sauce. You know, I hate tomato, but I love tomato sauce. I buy a lot of uh, tomate pelati, you know, tomate pelado, like skin, uh, skin peeled or peeled tomatoes. It can peel tomatoes. Uh, a few weeks ago, I made a tomato soup with those. Oh, Jesus Christ. Tomato soup should not exist. And then, and then I fried some, uh, some cheese sandwiches. So get some bread and some cheese and just fry the cheese on the bread and you dip the sandwiches in the tomato soup and it's it's delicious so you made tomato dip but yeah, it's but soup because it's hot no but it's good because it's tomatoes those tomatoes mixed with lots of butter and lots of milk and then you just heat it up and and smash the tomatoes together tomato with butter and milk yes that's how you make tomato soup in yeah. America? Ah, uh, anywhere. Oh. Why don't you just have butter and milk? Well, that would be all right, but what, don't you want a tomato flavor? I guess, I guess. Well, I'll try to make that once, um, just to check. The things you told me to do, or I trust you for, for cooking, for food. You, you have good ideas, American ideas. And when American meets Brazilian, you had better ideas. Uh, both of Talking. these are like my mom's my mom's cooking. The meatloaf and the tomato soup are two things that my mom makes a lot. Okay, just a second, sorry. Uh, no, I, we never make never make tomato soup around here. We but usually, there in the United States, we have tomato soup like like Campbell's tomato soup, you can just go buy and then you add milk to it and it's done in like five minutes. But okay. since you can't, well, you can buy Campbell's in Brazil, but it costs like 30 reais. <laughs> uh, in America it's one dollar. It. Yeah, it's a dollar, exactly. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. I haven't, I haven't cooked. A lot, just regular food for every day. I, I cook for me, Vito and Mari, my wife and my son. If people don't know that, I cook for them uh, every day, uh, lunch and dinner. Lunch for me and Vito, dinner for me, my for Vito, Mari and I. So it's just regular everyday food. Sometimes I buy pizza, sometimes I make burgers. Um, I haven't been on a diet for this quarantine, so when I'm on a diet, I, my food is different, you know, very different. You should now, try the, the secret to good burgers that I learned from uh, Gordon Ramsay is Worcestershire sauce. Or molio inglese. Yes, yes, I like Worcestershire sauce very much. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Ryan, I'm sorry, Ryan and people, I'm sorry. But, uh, that's all the time I, I have for the day. Okay, I've, I've been I'm being called, I'm being 
people are calling me, okay? You're being there's summoned. A in the, so, yes, I'm being summoned, yeah. There's a son in the dog for me to, to check up on. So, uh, but thank you very much uh, for, I don't know, you, you should be thanking me. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for thank gracing you. me with your presence. And, and we'll see everybody next week. And check us exactly. out on Instagram on our lives during the week. Uh, we try to do a couple, but check us out as often as you see us. So we'll see you there. We'll see you next week. Like us, share us, subscribe, do all those crazy things, and see you again next time.